I just finished making this potato vodka and thanks to a secret ingredient, it's super easy to make. It's tasty, it's delicious, it worked out wonderful and I'm gonna show you how to make it. How's it going chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, this is Still It and the first potato vodka video I made is by far the most successful video on this channel but, but there was a couple of specific and well thought out criticisms that keep popping up on that video. Today, I'm gonna address those and make another potato vodka. Way easier, with way cheaper equipment. Let's get stuck in. Today, we're getting stuck straight into the mash to make this potato vodka. Uh, over here, I have a mash tun with around about 30 liters of strike water, which is currently at 67 degrees Celsius. On this side, I have four and a half kilos of ale malt. You could use distiller's malt, uh, anything with a high diastatic power pretty much. We want heaps of enzymes out of this stuff. Uh, remember team, you need to mill it first, crush it down into uh, chunky bits with a little bit of powder is kind of what I'm aiming for for this sort of thing. Uh, so I'm gonna get mashed in with this first and then we can deal with the potato stuff afterwards. So a little bit goes in, and then some stirring. Rinse and repeat until uh, all of the grain's in here. <laughs> Ale malt we're using primarily for the enzyme contribution here. You could of course use uh, bottled enzymes sometimes, depending on where you are. They're a little bit hard to get hold of, to be honest. Uh, wherever you are, I almost guarantee, as long as someone is making homemade beer, you can get hold of ale malt. And to be fair, learning this process is gonna help you a whole lot in distilling. So if you wanna make bourbon, you do this with corn and barley. If you wanna make single malt, you use barley. Anyway, moving right along, next we have one and a half kilos of quick oats or rolled oats. In they go. Uh, these are gonna add a little bit of flavor for sure. They are also gonna give us a whole lot of body uh, and kind of a, like a rich silky feeling in our final vodka. Uh, that is why we're adding these in. Now it is time to talk about potatoes. The last time I made potato vodka, I did it using actual potatoes. The downside to that is any starch you're going to use in a mash for a spirit needs to be gelatinized first. That just means it needs to be cooked so it's available to be dissolved in liquid so the enzymes can do their thing. That was fine, but it was a whole lot of messing around, a whole lot of pissing around, uh, and it's kind of a giant pain in the butt. Enter potato flakes. These have already been gelatinized. We don't need to do it, which means we can throw them straight into the mash, which is pretty freaking awesome. All of the potato flakes are now into the mash tun, uh, but I have been talking to the camera and sprinkling <laughs> potato flakes all around the workshop, trying to figure out where to get the shot for creamy B-roll. Uh, and because of that, the temperature of the mash tun has dropped significantly. It got down to about 58 degrees Celsius. Uh, and as you can see now, the mash has actually thickened up quite significantly. So that is uh, the gelatinized starch and the potato going into solution, mixing up in the water and basically thickening the mash. As this comes back up to temperature and gets up to around about 65 degrees Celsius, uh, it will thin out considerably, which is actually kind of cool that you guys are going to get to see that. We've had the power on now for about five minutes and we're back up again at 65 degrees Celsius. I am gonna cover this up, let it sit for 45 minutes, and then if we need to, I might heat it up again and we'll see how it's looking. After 45 minutes, the temperature had dropped down by a few degrees, so I flicked the power back on. Cool thing about a mash tun like this is you can just heat it up whenever you want, not worry about scorching. Uh, turned the power back on, gave it a good stirring until it got back up to 65 degrees Celsius again and let it sit for another 45 minutes. We are now ready for mash out, which means getting the liquid out of this pot and into the fermenter. I've got the fermenter sitting down underneath and uh, once again, it's very easy with a mash tun like this, you just uh, open the valve up. <laughs> If you watch the first potato 
vodka video, you'll realize we're going into the fermenter a whole lot cleaner this time. This is really noisy. Let me move. In that first video, we put all of the smushy potato, the grain, all of it into the fermenter, which is cool. There's an argument to be made that you might get a little bit more flavor that way. The downside is that you have to deal with that smushy stuff. You either need to strain it out later on, or you need a still that can deal with distilling on grain. And one of the criticisms I had in that video is that I used some really fancy equipment. That was fair criticism. So this time, we're dealing with the smushy, chunky stuff at this stage, filtering it all out, which means we can use much more accessible equipment when we get to distillation. This is a bit of a sticky, slimy mash, uh, and especially with a fine mesh mash basket like this, it might take a little bit of time to actually drain out well. Don't be disheartened by that, just be a little bit patient. Uh, stir it a little bit, kind of scrape the sides down a little bit, uh, and it will, you will get most of the liquid out. Time to go in with the sparge water. I'm using about 20 odd liters of uh, hot liquid. So I've tipped about half of that liquid in here uh, at the moment, so about 10 liters. Just give it a little bit of a stir up, sort of wash it all through. This is really just helping us up our efficiency a little bit on this mash, get a little bit more sugar out of it. I'll shimmy this thing forward. Eh, eh. <laughs> and uh, we can open that valve up again. Another criticism that that original video had uh, was that it was a whole lot of work for not a lot of result. Once again, fair. We have a secret ingredient. That isn't so secret, this is just table sugar. <laughs> That's right, regular viewers, this is in fact a safety net video. For those of you that don't know, the safety net series is a series of videos that encourages newer distillers to make the jump over into all grain distilling with the safety net of throwing a bunch of sugar in it at the end. You get the benefit of the grain, real flavor, with the safety of knowing that even if you mess up the mash, uh, the sugar is gonna ferment. We haven't messed the mash up, but we're gonna throw some sugar in anyway. I have nine kilograms of table sugar I'm gonna throw in. Let's do that now. There is definitely an argument to be made that adding sugar in, rather than just making a bigger mash, is going to dilute flavor or have just a overall lower quality product at the end. And I completely agree but it's kind of a case of diminishing returns, especially, especially when we're making vodka. Our goal here is to distill this to a super high ABV and distill out a whole buttload of flavor that we would have if we were double distilling this. So adding in the sugar, doing it this way, you get a whole lot more product, a lot easier, a lot cheaper, and you're not losing that much. Anyway, time to top this fermenter off with cold water and talk about what yeast we're gonna pitch. It's time to talk yeast, which means it's time to introduce you to the sponsor of today's video, Angel Yeast. Long time viewers will know that I love using the AM1 for single malts, even for bourbons. The AG2 is great for clean grain ferments. The yellow label is excellent for feeling like an absolute wizard and fermenting starch without gelatinizing it or mashing it. But today, I'm gonna to be using the red label. Why is red label special though? Think of this kind of like a turbo yeast without the downsides. It's just yeast that doesn't have all the nutrients in there, lets you take care of that yourself. It ferments really freaking hot, up to 42 degrees Celsius, if you wanna push it that far. I've found the sweet spot is around 38 degrees Celsius, and this, you can get up to like a three day ferment with this, which is pretty freaking nuts. It does go hard, so you need to take a little bit more care, I think, with uh, pitching rates, nutrients and temperature control. For the batch I'm making today, we could probably sneak through without any additional nutrients because we have the potato, eh, but more specifically the grain and the oats in there. I'm not 100% relying on that, so I'm gonna drop in another three teaspoons of 
I don't know, whatever yeast nutrient is closest to hand when I get to it. Like I said, I'm going to temperature ferment to 38 degrees Celsius. The official pitching rate for a red label in a wash this size is 45 to 90-ish grams. Like I said, I like to push that to the higher end, especially if I'm going for speed. So I'm going to be pitching 90 grams of yeast. I came back to check on the fermenter about 30 hours later and I'd already missed peak fermentation as you can see by the Croizen ring. Three days in total and the wash was totally dry. And now we find ourselves at the pointy end of the operation, the fun part, distillation. In the original potato vodka video there was a bit of criticism in the comments around me using really expensive gear, which is fair enough. I mean, I had it, I wanted to use it and show it off which is also fair. Uh, but this time we're gonna go the opposite. Instead of using really expensive gear, we're gonna use much more reasonably priced equipment, and there is a bunch of different options for this. The T500 setup by Still Spirits is a pretty solid set of equipment to get into the hobby. Uh, there's links in the description for Australia and New Zealand if you're into that or interested in it. If you're in America, I would probably suggest something like the Claw Hammer setup, and there'll be links down in the description if you wanna check those out. I've already filled this pot up with wash. I tend to just use a bucket or a pot and scoop it out of the fermenter. Let's get it turned on and running and I'll tell you all about the stripping run. Wash is starting to warm up. I'm guessing you can probably hear that over the microphone. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the potential of a puke or boil over. If you have a look in the pot now, you'll see kind of a frothy, bubbly surface forming on top. As this gets up to a more vigorous boil, that has the potential to just keep building and building and go all the way through our still. That'll cause a puke or a boil over, whatever you want to call it. It's not great. Uh, easiest way to combat that is by not filling near the top. Give yourself a decent amount of headroom and you can use something to change the surface tension of the liquid to help those bubbles pop. I tend to just use a little knob of butter. Now it's time to get our still put together. So we'll get the head put on top. Eh, hold steady, clamp down. And we're almost ready to roll. Now this still is generally set up for reflux distillation, which is a good thing if you're making vodka. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but right now what I want to do is stripping runs. You don't have to do this. You can run it straight from wash if you want to. But the idea of a stripping run is to cut the volume we have in the fermenter way down and raise the ABV, allowing us to get a higher ABV when we actually run our spirit distillation. For this run, we're not worried about cuts, we're not worried about trying to decide what's good or bad, and we're not worried about getting a really high ABV. So we just wanna run this through nice and quick. I'm gonna run this thing in pot still mode just by taking the packing out. It's not in there anyway, I had it out for another reason. Uh, I'm just gonna run this at full blast and not stress about the ABV coming out the other end. The hoses are plugged in, there's water flowing through the condensers, the still's up to speed, and we are producing product down here in a large pot. I collect into a large pot so I can collect up all of the low wines, that's what we call the resulting spirit from a stripping run. We're just gonna let this run until the drips coming off the end are dropping down to around about, I'll probably go down to 10% today, 20% is an absolute minimum, 10% really, you should get down to 10%. When each individual stripping run is finished, dump out the remainder in the pot, fill it back up again from the fermenter, rinse and repeat until the fermenter's easy. This is gonna probably take me four runs. All said and done, it took me four stripping runs to completely empty the fermenter. Not gonna lie, that was a very long day of distillation and I forgot to mention that if you wanna get down below about 20% ABV with the T500 reflux still when stripping, you need to re-plumb the water uh, so there's only water passing through the product condenser. It's not hard to do, I've got another video entirely about using this still as a quote unquote pot still. You can check that out if you want to, honestly it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but let's get all these low wines in to the still. and we can get ready for our spirit run. What we effectively have here is 90 litres worth of wash and one 30 litres still. So it's a whole lot cleaner already, and it's at a higher ABV, and we get to basically fit more in. It's free space. That's why this generally works out to be more economical in terms of time and produce a better spirit than just putting the wash directly into the pot. The low wines are over there heating up right now. 
The low winds are over there heating up right now and this would be a wonderful time to take uh, all of the packing and put it back into the column uh, to fill this back up and get it ready for reflux distillation because we're making vodka, we want that high ABV goodness. But I'm not going to use this today. I've actually got a new toy and this is the first time I'm ever going to use it. So you're going to learn along with me. Uh, this is the pure distilling reflux still. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to give it a nudge. There's no affiliate links, there's no sponsorship, there's no nothing. Uh, it's just something that we're considering for our store. And anything we put in our store, I like to use first to make sure it's actually good. Eh, so let's give it a nudge. The faints in the pot are at a rolling boil. There's water going into the condenser and out, venting out into the sink. And we're starting to collect product over here on the spout. The stuff we're collecting at the moment, we're gonna call quote unquote four shots. Eh, today I think I'm gonna collect about 150 mils. We'll ditch that, we won't use it for anything beverage related. We're not gonna save it for later, anything like that. Weed killer, cleaner, fire starter. Those are my go-tos for it. I've just realized we're actually uh, looking more like 170 mils right now, which I'm not stressed about at all because we are going to take heads as well in just a second. But before I do that, let me switch this container out. Cuts, heads, heart, tails. What's the deal with a reflux still in a recipe like this? Here's the deal team. Uh, when the yeast goes to work on the sugar, it is going to create alcohol and carbon dioxide. Primarily, it's going to create ethanol for us, which is the stuff we want. But there's going to be a bunch of other byproducts as well. There will probably be a tiny little bit of methanol. Although this is a sugar wash, eh, it's going to be minimal. There's also going to be acetone and other fusel alcohols in there. We don't want to drink those. Lucky for us, most of those chemicals tend, <laughs> statistically, to come off at the beginning of the run. There'll be a little bit of them all the way through, but for the most part, they're going to come off at the beginning. The idea is just to collect up the stuff we don't want, separate it, and then in another jar, we'll collect the stuff we do want. But uh, how do you know when to switch? The only way to really know is to get used to judging it with your own senses. Primarily smell and taste. Feel, temperature, other things can kind of come into it as well. If you get a little on your hands, give a little rub to heat it up. Have it all uh, evaporating on your hands, you can give it a little smell. That'll kind of boost up the amount that you can detect. And what I'm getting right now when I do that is a almost rum-like, but kind of leaning towards potpourri, strange, estuary weirdness that I definitely don't want. And it also is very, very aggressive on your senses. So if you smell it, it's like nail polish remover. That's not good, we're gonna wait a little while. In the meantime, I've dumped my four shots into my four shots container, primarily used to light the pizza oven. <laughs> We're now pushing around about 500 mils of spirit and the flavor, sorry, the aroma has changed quite significantly. We've lost all of that kind of fruity, banana-y, flowery, potpourri kind of notes and now it, it smells pretty clean. This is probably a trap but I will taste it to kind of see where we're at. And fair warning guys, if you're new to this and you're not used to tasting high ABV spirits, don't do it like this. I'll show you a better way in a second uh, because you'll completely blow out your senses and uh, it'll probably be two or three hours before you can really taste or assess the spirit, but let me do it. <laughs> this is presenting almost like, not burnt rubber, hot rubber, I would say and a little bit more astringent. When this cleans up, we'll be ready for hearts. The idea is you just wanna be able to collect a roughly known amount off the still and then proof it down with a roughly known amount of water. So what a lot of home distillers will do is use spoons. Take one spoon, pop it under the spout until it's roughly half full. Take another spoon, dip it in some water until it is roughly half full. Mix the two together and sample it. <laughs> That's water, and it still went down the wrong hole. Mm. Okay, we're getting close, we're not quite there yet, 
Uh, this will inevitably lead to the question of why are there bent spoons all around the house? Uh, the answer is not magicians or drugs. Distillers. <laughs> this distillate is pretty damn clean now. That astringency and kind of rubbery flavor has faded away. So what I'm gonna do is switch over to a kind of a transition jar. Uh, gonna put this into faints, which basically means we can save it. And if you want to, you can add it back into the pot for your next distillation. And I'm gonna collect about 200 mils here just to make sure that I really am clean. Let me dump this into my faints keg, give it a rinse out, and then I'll carry on using this so we can keep track of volume for collecting hearts. I'm pushing probably about 130 mils in this transitionary glass now, and I'm thinking, I'm very, very confident that we're into hearts now, but I wanna check. And a great way to double check what your senses are telling you and see if, if you're not quite picking up on something, I think, is comparison. It almost gives you more resolution to your senses. So what I'm gonna do is take this out of the way and collect into a little Glen Cairn glass for just a second. And I'm gonna take uh, 10 mils of what I've already collected here and pop that into this glass. I'll wait until I've collected roughly the same amount in both glasses. Proof both of these down to roughly 45, 50% ABV. And now I can compare the two to see if things are still changing. This one came out of the transition jar and this one was at the end where I'm almost certain it's completely and utterly hearts. They're really, really close, but this is ever so slightly cleaner and I can't detect anything that I don't like in this one. So I'm really confident we're into hearts now. And in case you're wondering what ABV we're pulling, I've cooled this sample down to, actually I've cooled it slightly too much. It's at 19.5 degrees Celsius. This thing is calibrated to 20 degrees Celsius and it's reading 1, 2, 93.5%. I have just finished consulting with my little chalk check marks on the board and uh, we have a little under five liters. Thinking about the size of this wash, the ABV that's coming off, I'm thinking probably not much more than five liters is what I'm gonna get out of this. So I've switched back over to smaller jars and I'll be taste testing more often smaller amounts of the jar. If it suddenly goes to tails and I don't catch it, I only lose what's in the jar, not, you know, 900 mils of good product. And it turns out that's exactly what happened. Uh, at around about the 100 mil mark on here, I thought I detected tails starting to creep in, and then I thought I was crazy and let it go a little bit further. Uh, I checked it a couple of minutes later and it was starting to definitely be tails, so I'm just gonna ditch all of this. I'm not gonna keep any of it. I collected a little bit more just to try and describe what these tails present as. So for this one, it, it smells almost correct. Let me put that down for a second. It smells almost correct, but there's a slight little hint of, I always say wet cement. Now that I'm saying that, that's not quite right. It's more like wet cement, slightly acidic and baking soda-y. Just a hint of it. By the time we get over here, I almost can't smell that. That is, um, it's just wrong. That's how quick cuts can change or the flavors can change with a reflux still. Woo, <laughs> it's almost like ammonia, almost. So now we have our final product. I've measured the volume into this large 10 litre glass jar, vessel. What are these things called properly? I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I've measured the ABV, it's come out at 93% ABV. Now what we need to do is think about storing it and proofing it. Uh, if you have large glass or stainless vessels that you can cover up airtight, that's perfect. If not, think about using or reusing spirits bottles. You could store it at 90% ABV if you want to. Generally, if I'm using this, I'm gonna use it 
nothing higher than 60% ABV. So I'm gonna proof this down to 60% ABV. The easiest way to do that is go to chasethecraft.com, go to the resources tab and the calculators page and you'll find a calculator there. I've run this volume and the ABVs I have and want through that. Uh, and I need 2.6 liters of water, which I have measured out here. Uh, I generally don't stress too much about saponification, but proofing this much alcohol down this much, it kind of does come into my consideration. So I measure it all out uh, into a large pot like this. I know that everything in here needs to go into here and I'll just take maybe two, three days to slowly put a little bit more in there. That's 600 mils, probably a little bit much. Let's drop down to 300 uh, and start proofing this down. I think it's about time to finally taste this stuff. What do you reckon guys? I've got the potato vodka here and I'm gonna compare it to the silky vodka I made a little while ago. But first, a huge, huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much Patreons for being the people that support us day in, month out. It is because of you that I still get to do this as a full-time job. So thank you guys so freaking much. First of all, let's nose both of these. There is, there is a pretty distinct difference actually. I mean, when I just say distinct, I'm talking distinct in terms of vodka here. So I can, I feel like I could blind tell these apart, pick them out in a triangle test every time. Maybe I'm fooling myself, I don't know. The potato vodka is just kind of a more blunt, clean aroma. There's not a lot to it. There's a very, very slight earthy, Earthy is not quite the right word. I was gonna say it tastes like potato, but I've realized that I always eat potato with at least salt, and more often than not, some kind of, you know, it either has butter and mashed potatoes or olive oil and roast potato. You get the idea, right? So it's the smell of a pot of boiling potatoes. Whereas this really does have that slight brandy-like nose to it, which is interesting. But the flavor is very similar. It's a very compressed kind of flavor experience. You put it in your mouth, you taste it, you swallow it. It's clean, it's gone. You have a slight warming sensation in your mouth. This one is much sweeter. It is much silkier. It has a little bit more body and that fruity, oaty flavor lingers in your mouth a whole lot more. Are they really similar? Yeah, they kind of are, they're two vodkas. Are there distinct differences between the two? Totally. Is one better than the other? Not really. It just kind of depends what you're into or what you're trying to make with them. Did we nail the potato vodka? Yeah, I totally think I did. Considering the brief at the start, we made a vodka. It's got potato in it. Potato's kind of influencing the flavor. I'm putting it on the uh, you should try this at home list. So have a kick-ass week. I'll catch you next time. Keep on chasing the craft. See you guys.